Welcome into the Wednesday Bible study. What a thrill it is to be together again as we unpack God's holy word. Today we will finish uh, the Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 through 15. If you want to go ahead and find your way there, uh, we'll walk through that uh, verse by verse. We are in the study of the Revelation. Uh, This is not the first Bible study we've ever done. Uh, If you're new to what we do here, uh, you can go to themanchurch.com. Uh, and you will see a media button. If you kind of hover over that media button, there'll be a drop-down menu, and you either click you want to watch or listen. It's up to you. Uh, and you can go back through archives uh, for the past uh, several years that we've been doing this Bible study. We've done various books of the Bible. We've done some commentaries, uh, some topics, uh, and you can, even individual standalone Bible studies that uh, were just for that one session. You can find all those uh, and go back uh, on your own time. You can pick up the other I mean, here we are in Revelation 20, so there's a lot uh, from the Revelation that, that's archived, too, as we walk through the entire book, and uh, we'll finish that up uh, here in the next uh, few weeks. After that, we'll roll into Paul's second letter uh, to the church at Corinth. We'll do 2 Corinthians following uh, the Revelation, so make a note of that, fellas, as we go forward. Now, uh, today uh, I want to talk to you about uh, the Man Church conferences. We are going to be doing a couple of those in 2024. Uh, there'll be one in Birmingham on February the 16th and the 17th. That'll be at Sanford University. That'll be at the Wright Center. And then on March 8th and 9th, uh, we will be at the Butterworth, uh, Butterworth, is that what, Butterworth Theater or something like that. The theater at Mississippi State uh, at, uh, in Starkville, Mississippi on March 8th and 9th. So uh, those tickets are on sale now. If you're watching this Bible study, they're on sale. Uh, so go to themanchurch.com. You'll see this logo that is on the screen behind me. If you can't see it, uh, you'll see it right there at themanchurch.com. Click on that. You can buy tickets to both dates, or you can buy tickets to your preferred date. Uh, there will be different lineups. Uh, some will be the same, but there'll be. Uh, it will vary a little. Birmingham, uh, it will be Robbie Gallaty uh, from uh, from Long Hollow up in Hendersonville, Tennessee. Uh, pastor there. He'll be uh, in our guest slot in Birmingham. And then that same weekend, you'll hear from me. Uh, You'll hear from Rich Wingo. You will hear from Andy Blanks. Chuck Hooten uh, did uh, worship on our debut conference last year and did such a great job. Uh, He'll be back. But we also will be debuting new resources from themanchurch.com. Uh, Our conferences, uh, we're not just about high challenge. Uh, We certainly do that, but uh, we are about high equipping. So the discipleship part plays a huge role uh, in our format, and so you'll have new resources. Uh, Our our resources we already have will be available. And all of these, except for our guest speaker, are just teachers and writers uh, that are part of our team. Uh, So it's really almost like a summit where all these churches all over the country where you're doing our discipleship strategy all kind of converge on one city uh, and then find out what's the latest, and we spend the weekend worshiping together. Uh, and last year we were blown away by the presence of God, and we are excited about next year. Uh, and Startville, the lineup will be in the guest slot will be James Spann, a very uh, very well known meteorologist. If you're following my day job, you've heard him there, or you're from the uh, anywhere. Well, he's all over the country, but in Alabama, he's really well known. Uh, and he also graduated from Mississippi State, so he'll be there in the guest slot. Scott Dawson will be speaking. Andy Blanks will be speaking, and I'll be speaking there, and Chuck Hooten will be doing the worship as well. So there's the, the two lineups in the two locations, and all the tickets are reserved. We prefer that. That way you got your seats. You can all sit together. Uh, if you need um, to order a, you know, a group, you can do that online. Now, the different ticket services, and, they, and they're different in, in Mississippi and Alabama, they vary on how many tickets they'll let you buy online in one, in one group. If you need to exceed the number, that is the limit. If you'll just call the ticket office, you can buy as many as you want. Okay, So just make a note of that. There's always a limit to how many you can buy online. They vary based on the service. If you exceed that limit, just call the ticket office, and you can get as many as you want to because I know your men want to sit together. And, and last year they came from, or this year, they came from all over the country. Uh, and if you're thinking about tickets, we did sell out in about 30 days this year. Uh, we expect to do that next year on both locations. Because not only uh, based on how many people didn't get a ticket this year, uh, but also based on the fact that uh, this time last year, we were only about half as many churches as we have now doing the strategy. We've doubled uh, in uh, in the last year. So so there's more churches that have more men coming. So I, I wouldn't delay on this. Uh, you know, don't be like some of the guys this, this year in February. 
I, I could not believe it uh, where they were trying to contact us in a panic the Tuesday before the conference wanting 15 tickets and, 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 and 10 hotel rooms. So uh, that that's not wise. That's not going to happen. Now, the good news is uh, Birmingham uh, is a much is a bigger city than where we were uh, this year. And, you know, the airport's uh, easier and all that. But the seats are, are about not quite double what we had in Oxford. So there's more room, but there's also a lot more people after tickets. Now, in Starkville, we're talking about about the same size, even a little less than Oxford was. So we expect Starkville to be a hard sellout. There's a lot of churches uh, in and around that area that, uh, that do the man church discipleship strategy. A lot of them are bringing big groups. So those tickets, I, 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 I think, will go re- really, really quick because there's only about 1,000 seats in that theater. So, so make a note of that and make your move at themanchurch.com and get ready uh, to be with us for 2024, Lord willing. It'll be uh, two outstanding weekends. So let's open in a word of prayer, and we'll jump right into the Revelation chapter 20. Lord, thank you for today. Uh, Thank you for the opportunity to spend some time in your holy word. Today, Lord, we look at a future event. It's futuristic, uh, but it is sobering, uh, as much of the walk through the Revelation has been. There's a lot to be exhilarated about, and that's the revelation of you and your glory. Uh, and then there's a lot uh, to uh, to be concerned about uh, that 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 daunting question that stands before each and every person: Have you been redeemed? Have you been justified? Have you been made, been made fully righteous? So when you're escorted today into the presence of a holy God, He sees you as fully righteous, uh, not as worthy of the lake of fire. Uh, and Lord, uh, help us today to discern this, and not only in our own lives but the urgency to tell others about your redemption. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. So let's go to the Revelation. We, we stopped in, at verse 10 last week. We're going to pick up in verse 11. Uh, this passage describes the final sentencing of the lost. Uh, and, and you're going to hear, and we're going to unpack today, uh, one of the most uh, serious and sobering and tragic passages in the entire Bible. Uh, it is most commonly known as the Great White Throne Judgment. Now, what does that mean? Well, it, it pretty much tells you what it means uh, there in its description. But it means that by the time the lost reach, and this is only for the lost, uh, the, those that have been redeemed will not face the White Throne Judgment. We will face the Bema Seat, and, and we, we spent time on that, uh, uh, or, and we'll spend some time on that in, in, in going forward. But the white throne judgment, this is for the unrepentant. This is for the lost. So when they stand before the one and only living God, holy, 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 there will be no appeal. There'll be no chance of parole. Uh, the, the only judgment that is handed down at the white throne judgment is a prison to which there is no escape. Uh, the language here is surprisingly plain. It's pretty straightforward. Uh, th- this is the John does not get in some eloquent, you know. Oh, l- uh, let me, what words can I use? He just shoots you real straight here on what he sees. Uh, it's not that hard to understand. It's hard to swallow uh, when you think about uh, anyone that we l- know and love that uh, continues to reject redemption. Uh, or thinks this is uh, that everybody's going to heaven, some of that stuff that's out there, pretty popular right now. It's very plain. It, it's stark. It's unblemished. Um, it, it's almost like when John, who is a very good writer, we, we see that in the Gospel of John uh, and even in his epistles, but it's almost as if John doesn't feel like that any eloquent modifiers are necessary. You know, it's, it's like I, I don't, I don't, I don't want to try to be poetic about something that is so tragic. Uh, and uh, and so we don't we, you you won't find that if you're not familiar with these verses. Um, it's almost have you ever have you ever thought to yourself when you had something that happened and you were about to tell somebody and you said to them, "No embellishment required." Uh, I really don't have to sell you on how bad this is when I tell you just what happened. It stands so much on its own. Uh, I'm just going to tell you exactly what happened, and I promise you that'll be frightening enough. I, I don't. I'm not going to have to sell you on this one. Uh, it is what it is, as we've heard. It it is simple, uh, but it is powerful. So the scene 
uh, we're, we're going to break it down. Uh, when you go through this, you're going to see we're going to set up the scene first. Then there'll be the summons next, the standard next, and then the sentence. That, that's that's kind of how we're going to walk through this. So let's start with the scene, and that's going to be verse 11 and then the front half of verse 12, 12a. Uh, so here we go. Uh, then I saw, which means what? It's a new a new vision. Then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. From his presence, earth and sky fled away, and no place was found for them. Interesting. 12a, and I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne. And, of course, we'll, we won't go in order chronological. I mean, it will be chronological, but some of these verses I'm actually going to do in a different order based on these four things I want to cover. Uh, so when don't think I'm missing things when I skip over something because I'm going to come back to it, okay? So let's first of all talk about the judge that is on the throne. Uh, we, 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 see, we see God. We, we see a judge on the throne. And then we see before the throne, we see the accused. Judge, accused. That's the scene that John sees. Uh, this follows the millennial reign uh, and the second coming uh, of Christ from uh, chapter 19. It precedes the new heaven and the new earth. Uh, so the first thing that John saw was this great white throne. Now, in the Revelation, 50 times a throne is mentioned. In this case, it's uh, the throne that is the seat of God's sovereign rule. Let's talk about some of the ways that John describes it. He says it's great. Uh, the, the size is, is, is greater. Uh, that's certainly part of it, but, but there's more. When he says great, it's not just the size of the, this, this great white throne. It is that, but that's not all it is. What he means here, when you look at the Greek word, he's also talking about it, its significance, uh, it's uh, it's majesty, it, it's authority. That that, that it's almost like this English word "great" right here really isn't enough. Uh, the word he's using is more descriptive. We're just limited in our English, so know that we're not just talking about size. That's there, but we're talking about significance, majesty. We're, we're talking about authority. He says it is white. Now we know what that means in the Revelation. Anytime we see white, it means that the one who sits on this throne, he must have a white throne because he's pure, he's holy. And that's always going to talk about that, purity, holiness. And you know what else is there? Justice. What he rules will be correct. There'll be no flaw in it. Um, and then uh, if, if you'd like to look at some of the visions of this, uh, one of them is, you know, we're going to reference Daniel a lot, uh, Daniel 7, 9, and 10. But I'm, I'm going to go over to Psalms real quick uh, because we've talked about Daniel 7 a good bit. Uh, but uh, but make a note that you'll see that there. So look at Psalms uh, 9, if you can flip to it real quick. If not, make a note of it if you don't have it with you. Uh, look, look at 7 and 8 in Psalm 9. But the Lord sits enthroned forever. He has established his throne for what? Justice. Uh, and he judges the world with righteousness. He judges the peoples with uprightness. The, uh, and, and then he goes on and talks to more about that, but that's the part about him sitting on the throne. So Jesus, it, it, the resurrection of judgment. Remember we talked about this over and over again. John talks about this in, in, in chapter 5 in his gospel, speaking of that, when he was spending time with Jesus. Remember what we said. Jesus' resurrection, after he has paid the price on the cross, and then he, he, he has now been risen from the dead, which we're told by the Holy Spirit. Once that, take place, once that takes place, something very interesting happens. We are either going to be redeemed by this truth or we're going to be judged by this truth. That's exclusivity. It means the new covenant is done, and there is only one way to be redeemed. Remember what, remember what got the uh, apostles in trouble? That got a lot of them martyred or stoned or jailed. What would they say? There is no, no name anymore in heaven and earth that anyone can be saved other than the name of Jesus. And, the, you know, the Jewish leaders would just lose their minds and the, and the pagans would lose their mind, and they were always getting in trouble of saying what? Exclusivity. It's Jesus. It's Jesus. It's Jesus. And if you'd like to have a little bit of that, brothers and sisters that may be peeking in uh, on YouTube or listening to the archive, uh, if you want to upset people, uh, be, be, refuse to move on Jesus. Like I've told you before, you tell people you're a Christian, most of the time it won't even bother them. 
because there's so many poor representations of that word now. Uh, and it really wasn't even a, a, a popular word in, in the new church to be embraced. We've kind of over-embraced that, I do believe. Uh, but but what, what they were telling people was that they were disciples of Christ. I, I'm a follower of Jesus. I am his disciple. Now, you start throwing that kind of stuff around, and people know real quick, oh, so you think that uh, exclusivity in Jesus alone. No, I didn't say that. Jesus said that. So, so Jesus is talking about, I mean, it was up to me. I, I guess I wouldn't care. I'm on, some of y'all might be annoying. I might not want to spend eternity with you, but I'm certainly not. I'm, well, there's some people I'm going to spend eternity with that I think, well, I hope glorification changes them. Uh, but, uh, and I'm sure it will. I don't think I'll be upset in heaven. And, and there's some people that are not thrilled about me being there with them. But, but anyway, uh, John 5, 29, listen, listen to what Jesus says, um, as, as your, your me might have taught you. It's in the red words. Uh, and, and he says, uh, 28, he says, Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice, talking about himself, and come out those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. So resurrection, it brings either eternal life for the redeemed, but it also brings judgment. Uh, so that that's what we're now seeing, and John is seeing. It's also talked about in, in, in Romans 2, uh, the great book of Romans, Romans 2. Uh, by the way, we do it, did a study on that, if you want to go catch the archive on that. In Romans 2, uh, verse 5, we see why this judgment. Why, why does this judgment have to take place? Uh, and the Apostle Paul talks about that in Romans chapter 2, verse 5. He says, Because of your hard and unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. Why are these people standing before the white throne? Because you, you, your hearts are hard, and, 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 and you would not repent. You have an unrepentant heart. And if that's the way you're going to be, uh, the Apostle Paul says, if that's what you're doing, if you're rejecting this redemption, you are storing up for yourself not eternal life, not justification, if you reject Jesus and, you're, and your heart refuses Jesus, then what you're storing up is actually wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. And guess what? That's what John's seeing. That day is here. Paul's warning. Can I ask you a question? Are you warning? Are you warning people that are in your influence? Are you just meandering through your life and saying, well, hopefully they'll find out. Maybe it'll be okay. Maybe one day somebody will say something to them. And uh, can you imagine what it would be like? Can you imagine you're there and you're the redeemed? I hope you are. I hope you all are. Some of you are still kicking the tires on this. And some of you uh, have some bizarre points of view. Uh, all you have to do is watch the comments under the archive of the YouTube. But, but the... But anyway, so can you imagine standing there? You're glorified, okay? I don't know that we can see the white throne. I don't know, but John sees it. And you look, and people that you interact with all the time are standing before the white throne judgment, and they're just looking, you're like, you knew this? I see you were fine with you being taken care of. Did you, did you hate me this much? I might have rejected it, but man, at least have to tell me about it. I, I, I thought we were all going to heaven. I thought God loves all of us. I didn't know anything about this, you know, exclusivity of the of Jesus. I thought Jesus was a good teacher and was a good man and said some cool things, and I thought he went around saying love is all we need. I didn't know he called us to repentance. You never told me that. I didn't know that much about Jesus. And you're just standing there going, well, too late now. So, so this is this is the kind of stuff that we need to be thinking about because I know if you're like me, and this just this just tells you how how flawed I am. I'm always studying these lessons, and as someone who's already redeemed, and this is this is ridiculous. I sometimes go, well, what's my takeaway? Well, there, there's one. I'm not going to face the white throne judgment. Yeah, but Rick, a lot of people are apparently. Could could you at least care about that? And the answer is, yeah, I, I can. So, so that's kind of our takeaway here. 
uh, because I know sometimes we we get in kind of a we got spirit. Yes, we do. We got spirit. How about you? And we're so excited about Satan being defeated, and we're so excited about this day finally getting here that we can push ourselves, and that day's going to come when the new heaven and the new earth comes. But in the process of getting there and looking forward to that, we can't get so caught up in how wonderful this is for us and completely forget how horrible it's going to be for the lost. Now, if they reject it, then nothing, and we're going to talk about that a little bit. There's nothing in the world we can do about that. We don't save anybody. But we will answer, apparently, through after, after parable, after parable, after parable, when Jesus was teaching. Apparently, though, we will answer, back to the Bema seat, we will answer for not doing what he told us to do. I'm not saying it's going to cost you your redemption. I'm not saying that at all. Uh, but, uh, but, but there is an expectation from God, and a better way to put it is a demand from God that those who have been redeemed, that they are his disciples, that, that we be making other disciples. I mean, that that's what we're told to do. That's obedience. And he says those who o- obey him are the ones who actually love him. So, uh, so anyway, so, and then he says, he who sat on the throne, the, 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 the words that are using here, that he's using here mean eternal, almighty God. If you look back, uh, in the Revelation, if you want to flip back to 4 uh, and look at uh, verses 8 through 11, you'll see, uh, you'll be reminded of, of of who is on the throne. You remember the throne in heaven? All the way back in the Revelation 4, can you all remember back to that? Uh, verses 8 through 11, I know some of you took so good, such good notes, you can go back there and look at it. And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes all around within, and day and night they never cease to say, holy, holy. Holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. And then whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who is seated on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They cast their crowns before the throne saying, Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and by your will they existed and were created. That's what we've been going back to. Now we're here for all this we heard in four. That there's God, and that's that's who He is. He is eternal, and He is on the throne, and and the Father and the Son share the throne. But make a note of this: the Son and the and our Triune God is uniquely in view here. So if you were like me, when the first time I started reading this, I'm like I'm I'm seeing the Triune God, but I'm seeing the Father. That really isn't correct. When you when you look here, all of this is really Jesus. The Father and the Son certainly share the throne, but the Son is uniquely in view here out of, out of the triune God. Uh, if you'd like to see more about that, I just gave you a little bit out of John 5. We, we talked about that. T- take a look at this. Jesus, anytime somebody tries to tell you, and it is garbage, all it means is they've never uh, read Scripture don't you ever let anybody tell you that Jesus never said he was God. Uh, that's a person that never has uh, has studied uh, the Gospel of John. He tells people he's God all the time. That just simply isn't true. They're hoping you don't know enough about the Bible to defend that. So John chapter 5, listen to this. Uh, here's Jesus himself, and this will give you the clarity right now at the white throne judgment. This is Jesus talking about himself. The Father judges no one but has given all judgment to the Son. That's important to take that note. That's John 5, 22. So Jesus said, the Father will judge no one. He actually gave that authority to me. So it, we know it's one God, three persons. I know that's mind-blowing, uh, but but it's true. But the Son has a unique role here uh, in our triune God of his own words. And then you look at 26 and 27. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. And look at 27. And he has given him, talking about himself, authority to execute judgment because he is, talking about himself, the Son of Man. So that that's right out of the Gospel of John. Uh, so we see Jesus is actually in a unique role to judge the lost right now. He said that was going to happen. You'll also find that. Uh, in Acts 10, 42, Peter is referencing that as well. So what does he mean when he says, from his presence, 
earth and heaven fled away. That's an amazing statement. What is he talking about here? That's the first thing when I was studying this. I'm like, what does this mean? You ever do that? You ever go back to Scripture that you've studied a lot of times or read a lot of times? You're like, this will be an easy lesson this week. I'm pretty familiar with this. And then all of a sudden you get back there and you go, what is this? What is it? I don't think I've ever even noticed that before. Or maybe I didn't, I didn't put any emphasis on it. From his presence, earth and heaven fled. An amazing statement. Well, you have to understand the earth has been through the tribulation. It's still tainted with sin. And it's subject to uh, um, you know, the, the effects of the fall. And God is about to create a new heaven and a new earth. Not, not, he's not going to go to the, this current state and say, think I'll make a few repairs. It's, it's not a fix them up okay? He's going to get a new heaven and a new earth. And so when the white throne judgment is coming into play, the fallen earth realizes, tick tock, we're about to be gone. And what it means is as he is creating this new heaven, new earth, that this current earth and this current heaven actually is fleeing away from the white throne because they're done. We're about to get a completely new heaven and a new earth. And, uh, and so um, the first heaven and the first earth must pass away, not merely be moved or reshaped. They got to go. So when he sees what he means, he said, I see heaven and earth moving away from that throne. You know why? It's over. That's gone. We're not going to reshape that. We're not going to repair that. It's going to be something completely new. Now, let me tell you what that also means to us. If you have decided to worship this he- this heaven and this earth, if you decide to worship all that you can see, the first heaven and the earth, you're going to be sadly disappointed when your God is gone. You're going to die with it because it, it will be no more. Uh, and, um, and, and really what we're talking about, and if you've ever read this, and we studied it in our study of Peter, also in the archive, Go to 2 Peter 3. Y'all have heard me reference this a lot. I love, and I can't remember who's using this phrase. This is either, I think this is John Phillips that used that phrase there. If not, it may be John MacArthur. Um, but, but anyway, the term they're using is God's uncreation of the universe. He's getting rid of the old. It's an uncreation. And, and, and Peter talks about this in 2 Peter Again, this is, this is uh, available to you in our, in our archives when we studied this. And I love this statement from Peter. So in 2 Peter 3, and we studied this, so I know for some of you this is repetitive, but we're going to do it again. All right, so let's go to verse 10. I won't read all of it, 10 through 13. And here's what Peter says. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. And I love this line from Peter right here. So he just told us that the the heaven and the earth that you now see, it's going to burn. And and, and, I mean, it it, it is going to go away so fast. Listen to what he says about it. I'm going to come back to 11. Let's go down to 12. Because 11 to me, in my opinion, I'm sure Peter likes my adjustment, I think should follow 12. But here's 12 waiting for the hastening and the coming of the day of God because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. But according to his promise, listen, we are waiting for a new heavens and new earth in which righteousness dwells. And now I'll go back to 11. Since all these things are thus, meaning since we know everything I just said is going to happen, that all this is going to be dissolved, what sort of people are you to be in lives of holiness and godliness? Peter says, my goodness, if we know this is coming, you'd think we'd live differently than we do. I will tell you that part of my life, I think the reason why I was so defiant and, and so sinful and treated sin with such disregard is because I really didn't believe it. I don't think you really can believe it and live that way. Think about that. I mean, I've told you this analogy before. Do you think if I believed that if I kept sipping on this bottle of water that I'm holding up, and what if I read Scripture that said if you sip on bottles of water and and you sip on bottles of water, your insides are going to burn and they're going to dissolve and you will be killed instantly? 
the day's coming when you, the continued drinking of this water will kill you. It, your insides will dissolve. They will burn. They will be gone. And I just keep doing this. Do you think I believe that? It is impossible for me to have a saving faith and truly believe that this is dangerous for me and continue to drink it. I really don't believe. Somehow I think I'm going to I'm going to circumvent around that somehow. And I think that's why we sin so much. You ever thought about the fact you just don't believe it? You just don't believe there's a new heaven and earth coming. You don't believe it's all going to burn. You don't believe that the white throne judgment is coming and people will be thrown in the lake of fire. You really don't believe it, and that's why you're so cavalier about your sin. I'm speaking for myself. I, I 100% was that way. And you would say, well, do you believe in Jesus? And I would say, yeah, yes, but the way I lived really meant that was a lie. Right? I mean, that we, we, we say that all the time. You know, remember the old thing about saying I had faith in that chair right there? Well, not until I sit in it. And then if I sit in it, you go, well, he really does have faith that chair is going to hold him because he sure did sit in it. That's a saving faith. And, and when I claim that sin is going to lead to my detriment and I'm going to die with the earth and I keep on sinning, not making mistakes, not, not, not say, gosh, what's wrong with me today, and repenting. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about just defiant. There's no way I can live that way and truly believe it. And that's why not, that's when I had to come to the conclusion that I was lost. No matter what claims, no matter what rituals I'd done, all this kind of stuff, the, those rituals had not transformed me. And then when I truly repented, as this scripture promised, then the process of transformation began and it continues. I was truly justified, which then led to automatic sanctification. Now, are there things I need to do to, to expedite and continue sanctification? Yeah. But I'm not the source of it. The source of it is Jesus. So, um, so this is a, this is the uncreation of the universe. And then, what did John say he saw next? He said he saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne. This is not all that complicated. What it meant is all the physically dead, all the unrepentant. Uh, you know, as you know, ha, that have been killed by God. There's no there's no living person uh, in this crowd. All unbelievers, all the unredeemed uh, that have all been wiped out by God have now been, uh, they're standing before him. These are not believers. Uh, all, all have been uh, transformed into eternal bodies. But here is the, the horrible part about the unredeemed. God calls them up from however they died or their bodies, whatever happened to them, and gives them eternal bodies for what? Condemnation. See, the redeemed are given eternal bodies for us to live in perfection. The unrepented, they get an eternal body too to be condemned, to eternally die. You got to understand this if you're watching or listening to this or you're in this room. Everybody's going to live forever. Everybody. It's just where you're going to live. You're either going to die forever and be aware of it, are you going to live forever in eternity? You're either going to live in damnation or you're going to live in perfection. And it says great and small. What does that mean? That's pretty simple. All will face judgment, nobodies and somebodies. All that worldly stuff of you're a somebody and you're a nobody, standing before the white throne judgment, we are all in equal need of God's mercy and the unrepentant, great and small. There'll be no buying your way out of this. You don't know who I know. I was a really big deal down there on earth. The one that's running from you right now. I was a big deal on that. I was always able to buy my way out of stuff. I could influence my way. Hey, let me do a little favor for you. And I really believe there'll be people trying to buy God off at the end. Surely all my wealth and all my prestige and how important I was on earth, surely, surely I won't be condemned. Not me. And then you say, well, Rick, what's the significance of him making sure we know the smaller there? You can't play that card either. Poor, poor, pitiful me. I'm a nobody. Can't you show mercy on me? Not if you didn't repent. No. I'm going to throw you in the lake of fire too. Because the great and the small. 
All are called to repentance. No one has earned their way into heaven by having a tough go of it or by being poor or not having much. So it's all about whether you've been redeemed or not. And uh, there, there's, there's, there's a lot of commentary about that that's really um, just the whole scene that he's seeing. Can you imagine it? So then next, so we had the scene. Next is the summons. Now that's going to come from 13A. Uh, so I'm going I'm to look at that. See, I'm, I'm skipping around a little bit, but you'll, you'll see why. So in 13A, and, and the sea uh, gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. So here's the summons. The accused who had been tormented and now come before the judge for their final sentence. Uh, and, and, and before, when, when you look at this, um, all, of, all of what happened when the sea um, took life, why is that mentioned? Well, when we get to 21, you're going to see that a statement is made that the sea is no more in the new heaven and the new earth, and, 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 and it goes out of existence. But before it goes out of existence here in 20, it gives up its dead, which were in it. All who were killed by the sea will be resurrected and stand judgment. Death and Hades gave up their dead. Hades is the Greek word for Shehol. Both mean the realm of the dead. And, and Shehol is talked about in the Old Testament a lot. Hades 10 times in the New Testament. Shehol 67 times in the Old Testament. Uh, Luke also documents a conversation about this in Luke 16, 23. This is the unrighteous dead. Uh, and this is where they are kept pending their sentencing to hell or the lake of fire. And unlike the lake of fire, Hades... Uh, does not last forever. Uh, Shehol, that this these are the same place. This is almost like where there's a final heaven. This, uh, but but yet there was a there was a heaven uh, that, that existed before the final heaven. Hades, Shehol is where the unrepentant dead are held before they are cast after this judgment at the white throne. And, and death, the word here uh, it refers to anywhere dead bodies of the unrepentant lie because we know the sea gave up their dead. This term death means, and wherever else they were dead bodies, they all were resurrected as well. And what they get is resurrected bodies that are suited for hell. So John said, uh, let me tell you, no matter where they died or how they died, the unrepentant were brought before the white throne judgment, and there they stood. It didn't matter if, if the sea had, uh, their, their bodies had rotted and were nothing. They came up out of the sea before the sea was no more. And God rounded everybody up that was unrepentant, and they stood before him. And they all were put back in bodies that were suited for the lake of fire. Next is the standard. So that's the summons. They've been summoned before him. Now we go to the standard. Uh, we'll go back to 12 now and then the rest of 13, which some of it I just read to you because I got on the road. But, uh, but here's 12b. It says, and books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. And then I already read this, and it says um, they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. So the, the, the judge opens up the books, um, and um, Daniel 7, 9 and 10 talks about this as well. I say we reference that a lot. Books, they, these books contain a record of every thought, every word, every deed, uh, of every unsaved person who ever lived. Sinners' deeds perfectly, accurately, comprehensively are kept. And now God brings out these records that he has been keeping on every single person. And what he is going to do is show you how much you deserve to go to hell. And the fact that, and how much you needed repentance that you refused. You didn't think you needed repentance, but I'm about to give the record of every thought, every deed, everything you did, every motivation. And by the time I'm done, you're going to hear that you did need repentance. I offered repentance. You rejected it. And what I'm about to do, you do deserve. 
And every one of us deserves to go to hell. I would not want my record to be read. Jesus talks about this. Sinners, after they hear this, and it's measured against God's perfect holy standard, they will come to the horrible conclusion that they're about to get what they deserve. If you have your Bible, let's let's go to Matthew 5. Uh, Matthew 5, uh, this is Jesus uh, talking about this on the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, let's go to 5, and then let's look at verse 48 of 5. And this is Jesus talking. You, therefore, must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Now, can you imagine sitting there and hearing that? What did he say? He said we have to be perfect. He said God's perfect. Now, why is Jesus saying that? Jesus is saying that because he's taking away any notion that any arrogant human being has that somehow any of us have been so good and we've been so impressive against God's standard that really we're in no need of repentance. And I've heard some pretty famous people when asked what they regretted in their lives, and they'll look into the camera and say, no regrets. No regrets? I don't have things to be forgiven for. What? No regrets? Let me tell you something. Do not get the no regrets bumper sticker. I have tons of regrets. Regret is what brings us to repentance. No regrets? I don't have anything to be forgiven for? Well, that's, that's, uh, that's part of uh, what everybody's missed. Jesus would say to that person, so you're perfect? Because I got news for you. My father is perfect. You're perfect? Pretty much. Well, that is a gross, gross misunderstanding of human depravity and an even gr more gross misunderstanding of God's perfection and holiness. And that point will be made to all. Who makes us perfect? Jesus. And that's the point he's trying to make. Now, if y'all try this without me, I hope you're perfect. You know, it, it reminded me of the funny story of my dad uh, when he was a coach and, and he had told us to help him with his cussing and swearing and he let the captains paddle him if every time he said something wrong uh, that he shouldn't have said, and it came my turn. And I told him that after it was over, and I, I gave him a harder lit with a paddle as I could possibly give him. And as I walked by his office, he said, did you enjoy that? And I said, it hurt me so much to do that. I didn't want to do that. I said, but you told us to do it for you, and I was just trying to do what you asked us to do because I love you, and it hurt me to do it. probably hurt me more than it hurt you. I got to pull all that back on him, and I'm just about to turn around all smug, and he says, boy, there's a lot of season left. <laughs> I said, yes, sir. He said, well, I hope you're perfect. hope there's no reason for me to have to discipline you before this season's over. And I realized that I had made a commitment to perfection, and I was never going to meet it. And so Jesus is making that point to remind us how much we need his righteousness because ours will fall far short on our best day. Adrian Rogers, the great pastor who's already in the presence of the Lord, he said, I would not present my best 15 minutes in front of a holy God. Not even my best 15 minutes. Peter talks about this in verses 15 and 16 of, uh, of that wonderful chapter 1. Remember these, horrible, these statements? But as he who has called you is holy, you also must be holy in all your conduct. How many of you like that verse to say some of your conduct? All of your conduct. You, you see what, what the Bible keep, keeps trying to get us ready for? The Bible and Jesus himself is saying, you'll never meet this standard. You must repent. You must leave faith in yourself. You must place your faith in me. 
I've gone to the cross, I've resurrected, and I'll escort you in front of a holy God, and he'll see you through me, and you'll be perfect. To try another plan will lead to your damnation. Rich Wingo, my dear friend, told me about watching a man give a testimony that, that brought him to Christ. And he gave that vision of the white throne judgment. He said, and I, and, I, and I had a dream of me standing there, and he said, and Satan is just saying, of course, that's not accurate here because Satan's gone. Really, God's the one who's reading everything you did wrong, not Satan. But in the, in the dream the guy had, he said, the accuser was accusing me before God. You cannot redeem this person. He said, and he's rolling everything I ever did, everything I ever thought. And he said, it's connected to some of that old computer paper that's going into like an 18-wheeler. And he said, I realize he's only getting started. And I begin to weep. And I said, I wish he would stop reading all the horrible things that I've done. I wish he'd stop accusing me before God. And he said, and then my Lord and Savior Jesus looked at his father and said, hey, he's with me. Satan, you just take that, pack that up, and go on. He's with me. Hey, and, and, and when the Father says, it says, oh, you're with my son, but well, then come on. I make him fully righteous. So Jesus uh, has resolved the issue for us. If you have uh, uh, your Bible, go, go to the book of Galatians. And, uh, you know, because let's get some good news, right, for the redeemed. Um, that's why it's called good news, folks, uh, because when we look at what we deserve— and we look at what God has done for us, there is no wonder that it is called good news because, let's face it, uh, we have no hope of accomplishing this on our own. And Jesus, through the Apostle Paul, gives us the good news in Galatians um, chapter 3, and then we look at verses 13. And these are very, very comforting words. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, by becoming a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree, so that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. He went to that horrible tree because that's where we deserve to go, but he went there in our place and offered perfection and redemption to all who repent and confess him as their Lord. So they're going to be judged for what they had done, including their thoughts. Psalms 44, 21 says that God knows every single thought, every feeling of our hearts. Romans 2, 16 says that he will judge the secrets of our heart. We're also told that we will be judged by our words. Matthew 12, 37, uh, Matthew 16, 27 uh, we'll be judged by our actions, Ecclesiastes 12, 14, Romans 1, 20. Hell will fit the iniquity. Each punishment will fit the individual. Now, when you hear me say that, I feel a little movement in the room. What, what, what do you say? So so there's degrees? Yeah, there, there are. The punishment will fit the, the person. Uh, and and I say I, I can say y'all looking. At, are there degrees of punishment in hell? Yes, there are. Uh, Jesus actually talks about this quite a bit, especially in Matthew eleven. But let's let's go back to Matthew uh, ten. Uh, some of you may be hearing this for the first time. Uh, now let me tell you, if you've got the best situation in hell, it's still going to be absolutely horrible. But Jesus has actually spoken to this. Uh, here's some of the things that Jesus said, Matthew ten. And if anyone will not receive you, talking to his disciples, or listen to your words, shake off the dust from your feet when you leave uh, that house or town. Truly I say to you, it will be more bearable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah than for that town. What? He, he says it will be worse on that town than Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment. Why? Well, because the new covenant has come to those towns. Sodom and Gomorrah never saw the they they, they didn't understand redemption that they they didn't they not received the gospel of Jesus now they they could have they could have been right with God they could have had an, a saving faith uh, uh, faith in they could have repented I'm not saying that but what I'm saying is he says they didn't get the shot that you got if they had heard what you guys came in preaching a lot of them are repented in ashes and dust if you don't believe that uh, just look look at chapter eleven. And here's Jesus saying those exact words in 21 and, and 24. 
He's talking to these cities where he did 90% of his miracles, where he spent his three years of ministry. He spent most of the time in these cities. And listen to what he said about these cities. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the mighty works done in you had been done in Tyre or Sidon, both of them were destroyed by God, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I tell you, it will be more bearable on the day of judgment for Tyre and Sidon than for you. And for you, Capernaum, will you be exalted to heaven? You will be brought down to Hades, for if the mighty works done in you had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. But I tell you that it will be more tolerable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom than for you. You know what he's saying? If these cities had got the shot you got, if they'd seen me and all the miracles I did, they would have repented. So you have seen all this, and you remain unrepentant, And I will tell you this, your punishment will be worse. You know why? Because you should have known better. And let me tell you what that means to us. Will the street walker in Las Vegas, if she doesn't repent and die in her sin, will she go to hell? The answer is yes. But let me tell you, some of us sitting around in here watching this, listening to this, that you can't drive two miles without another church on the corner, and you've heard the gospel over and over and over and over and over and over, and you still haven't repented? Let me tell you what Jesus is saying. That street walker, if she had seen and heard what you had, she would have repented. And I find her punishment to be worthy and fit her crime, but your punishment is going to be worse. Because she never heard what you heard. Now, she didn't have excuse. But she's got more of an excuse than you did. And I find your rejection of me to be more repulsive. Because you heard the truth. Over and over and over. And you still rejected me. It's all miserable. If you want to see some others, we're just running out of time. Go read Mark 12, 38 through 40. And the writer of Hebrews discusses this in the very troubling chapter 10, verse 29, about those who hear and know and still reject. It's all miserable, but the level of misery will vary. Another book was opened, the book of life. Uh, This is the book of the citizens of heaven, the redeemed. So if you're not in there, you'll be eternally damned. So he takes one book and says, here's why you're going to be down. Here's all the stuff you did, and you didn't repent of any of it. But he goes over to another book. Here's another reason you're going to the lake and fire. You're not in here. Here's my redeemed. I can't find you. I see all this about you, and I don't find you in here. Both of those are going to condemn you because you're not in the book of life. Their names are not there. If you have your Bible, Matthew 7. Now, we've talked about this a lot. We spent a lot of time in Matthew today, haven't we? Matthew 7, Jesus, remember him winding down the Sermon on the Mount? And, buddy, it gets rough. Uh, I have preached this over and over and over and over because I just can't get away from it and uh, because Jesus is saying something that is so true. Uh, remember this, uh, verses uh, 22 and 23. Now, let's start in 21. And then get those. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, and this is going to be happening at the great white throne, on that day, which is what he's talking about, many will say, Lord, Lord, do we not prophesy in your name, cast out demons in your name, do mighty works in your name, and I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. You know what he's saying? I'm going to look in the book. And a lot of y'all have a lot of, you do a lot of mouthing about me, but you do not do the will of my Father. You are not obedient to me. You, you continue in de- deliberate, perpetual sin because only those that do the will of my Father, obedience, the fruit that's flowing out of their lives. If you want to know who's with me, look at what they're doing. And what they're doing didn't earn their redemption, but what they're doing will show you their redemption. And you can mouth about me all you want to and claim I'm part of something, but when you look at the lives of the individual saying it, if you don't see them doing the will of my Father, they won't be in the book. I don't care what they've said about me. 
There'll be people shouting, hey, we used to talk about you. We had bumper stickers with you on it. We went to church if it wasn't raining. Or we didn't have a ball game to get to. Or weren't down at the lake. He would say, you just did that out of some cultural obligation. You weren't devoted to me. I don't know you. You have a demonic faith. So you believe in the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit. So what? So do the demons. But they certainly don't serve me. They're fighting and rebelling against me just like you. And if you don't believe that, this is the kind of stuff he's talking about. He's talking about devotion and not to earn salvation because I'm devoted to Christ now because I've tasted of the Lord and he is good. I want to be where he is because of how wonderful he is, not because I'm hoping that I'm doing enough or he'll be okay with me. I can't help it now. He draws me. I can't get away from him. I can't be interested in anything. He is so much better than anything else that these things flow from me uncontrollably. I don't, I don't make myself go to church. I'm drawn to church. I don't make myself sitting here and teach. I desire to sit in here and teach. I don't make myself go out and tell people about Jesus. I don't do that begrudgingly. I can't help but do it. And that's what he says. Remember what he says in John 15? If you abide in me and I abide in you, I will produce in you much fruit, and my Father will be glorified by this, and it will prove that you're my disciples. So are you a disciple of Jesus? Well, let me see what fruit flows from you. But, but I, want, I want you to think about this. I mean, what would you think? The men in here, raise your hand in here if you're married. Okay, most of us. Can you imagine? Think about my precious wife that we just went through. We've been through so much together and just went through something else, and, and hopefully she's going to be completely done with this. But can you imagine me telling her that I loved her and I said, and here's how I'm going to show you. I'm going to see you every Sunday. Well, I, wait a minute. Not every Sunday because it might rain. I might be hunting. Might be late getting back from the ball game. Okay, so some Sundays. I'm going to show up. I said, I'm going to get here about 9. Uh, and I said, and then I'm going to tell you that I love you. I'm going to sing songs to you. I'm going to bring you poems and letters, sweet love letters. And I'm going to do that till about noon. Okay, now at noon, you're not going to see me. I got other things to do. I got places to go. And uh, and I might be back next Sunday. Now, you're not going to hear from me during the week. You're not going to be tell, you're not going to hear. There'll be nothing devotion to you of any kind during the week. Now, I may be back next Sunday. If it doesn't rain, I'm not at a ball game or I'm not hunting or fishing or playing golf. I, I So I'll, I'll try to get back next Sunday. And then I'll tell you again that I love you and I'll sing some songs to you and, and I'll, I'll write love letters to you till lunch. Do you think my wife really thinks I love her? Where do we get off thinking Jesus buys that garbage? You think he buys that? Yes, sir. You say you love me, but here you are at the great white throne judgment. You know why? Because you never showed me you love me. Your actions didn't confirm it. There was no evidence of me in your life. You had no yearning for me. You treated me as something that was easily disregarded. And my name served your purpose. Your name never served mine. And that's what he's going to say, and that's what he's talking about in those troubling words of Matthew 7. And they will ask God to reconsider, and they'll refuse to acknowledge their guilt, but they rejected Christ. And the only way to be forgiven and made righteous has passed. And God will tell them, you're guilty. 14 and 15, and we'll be done. The sentence, 14 and 15 of the Revelation 20. Here comes the sentence to all that are there. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Judgment is swiftly carried out. The lake of fire, the final hell. They will go out of existence, swallowed up by the final hell the second death, the lake 
of fire. Fire 20 plus times in the New Testament. Is it a literal fire? No one really knows. If it's symbolic, it's likely to represent something more horrible and painful than literal fire. The Bible says hell is a place of darkness. The inmates are isolated. It's a place of the worm. Could be that accusing conscience that always is reminded of the horrible things you did and you would not repent of. Could be a literal worm. But we know that uh, it devours the wicked and this whatever this worm is that tortures and how it tortures, that worm will never die. Isaiah 66, 24, Mark 9, 28. It's a place of banishment from God's kingdom. Uh, Matthew 8, 12, 22, 13. It's a place of unending sorrow, weeping, and gnashing of teeth. Matthew 8, 12, 13, 42, 24, 51, 25, 30, Luke 13, 28. Turn with me to the book of Hebrews and we'll be done. Hebrews 10, 26, beginning in verse 26, and we'll go through 31. And this is for those that will refuse to repent. So let's say right now you've heard all this and you refuse to repent. Here's what happens. For if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there, is, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the evidence of two or three witnesses. How much worse punishment do you think will be deserved for the one who has spurned the Son of God, has profaned the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified, and has outraged the Spirit of grace? For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, and again the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall to the hands of the living God. There's the warning. If repentance is something that you have decided to refuse, let's pray. Lord, thank you for today, and thank you for this harsh reminder of two things, uh, your judgment, but also a wonderful thank you for redemption. May we never take it lightly. May we not be afraid to examine ourselves and ask that hard question. Am I certain that I won't be at the white throne judgment? Am I going to be one of those screaming out, but Lord, I thought I was with you? Well, let's not be afraid to examine ourselves and see if we see the proof of you while we still have time. Thank you, Lord, for convincing me that I had made a declaration about my redemption that was completely unfounded and completely false, and you were kind and gracious enough to call me to true repentance. Thank you for that, Lord. May you never look upon my life, as the Apostle Paul said, and see that the grace that you have given me was in vain. Help those, Lord, who are crying out to you right now and, and hear their repentance. Redeem them, Lord. And if you're one of those people and I can help you in any way, just rick at burgessministries.com. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Thank you for your time today.